Good morning, everyone. Morning. morning. What a beautiful day God has prepared for us once again. And it is great to gather with you all here in worship this morning at Hayshire UCC. Our candles will be lit in a moment to represent and remind us of Christ's presence among us. We remember that Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with you. And today we do come together in person, through video and phone, from all corners of the area as one body of Christ. And whenever we do come together as the family and friends of Hayshire, we always hope that this is a time and a place to rest and to encounter God within our midst. A uh, little quick reminder, today is the first Sunday of the month, and as you see, we will be having communion. So if you did not bring um, anything from home to share, uh, there are crackers and juice on the back table, so make sure you hop out and get those. Or if you're at home, uh, you have a few minutes while Lainey's playing music for us or while we're doing announcements to get something together, bread, crackers, whatever, and a beverage so that you're ready when we get to that point in our service later on. So next Sunday, we will begin our summer worship time. So rather than meeting at 1030, we will be moving to our 10 o'clock worship time starting next Sunday. There will be email reminders um, sent out. We'll hopefully get that up on our sign with our quick reminder of summer hours, 10 o'clock starting next Sunday. Um, so we'll have that change available. So if you need to check in and all of that, uh, please do so. Also, last week, Joanne mentioned about our Strength in the Church offering. This is in one of the five offerings that we do for the National Office, United Church of Christ. And it goes to help other congregations or even ours. We have the option of that. It, the assistance is provided through grants. So we can apply for a grant to National Office if we need it. Um, during the pandemic, this became really important for some of the smaller churches to help set up technology so that they could stay in touch with each other when doing so in person was not really an option for them. So strengthen the churches is available now. And if you would like to make an offering, don't have an envelope. We have some blank envelopes outside on one of the small tables uh, so we can make them available for you. You can drop it in the collection plate on the back table. We have a few events coming up this week, and I'm going to let Barb Crumb kick it off. She's talking about book club for Thursday night, so she's going to come up and share some info on that for you. Is that slow enough, Ethan? <laughs> You're good. Okay. Um, book club people, uh, we're going to try to do the first in-person uh, book club this uh, Thursday evening at six o'clock, but luckily I'm playing next Sunday and realized that Lainey has lessons in here on Thursday evening, but she's out of here by 615. So for anyone that was planning on being here in person, if we can just change to 630, uh, I don't think that'll affect anybody by moving it up just a half hour that way. Lainey can get her lessons in. We can still do in person and Zoom at the same time then. So 6.30 instead of six o'clock this coming Thursday evening. Thank you. We'll send a reminder email out with yes. any change. Thank you. What's the book we're reading? Ah, uh, then we'll choose from the quiz. Okay, well, we'll have the title it typed out when we are sending out the reminder email. So even if you have not read the book yet, you can participate in book club because part of the time that they have together is really about connecting with each other as well as discussing the book. So come out and join them either in person or via Zoom Thursday evening at 6.30, not 6 p.m., 6.30. And we'll send out a reminder email to those that have it. If you have a question, please call the church office because good news is Dawn's gonna be back this week. So we're looking forward to that. She'll be in tomorrow at nine. She's in Monday through Thursday, nine to noon. So you can call and check in with her if you have any questions. Also, we have going on this week, Friday night is table talk, right? Glenn says yes at 6.30. And the, it will be connected to our wired word that 
Len emailed out today. So we will also send a reminder about that as well. So a lot of things happening this week. And then on Saturday, some of us are participating in Penn Central's annual meeting. It used to happen up at Susquehanna University in Sealings Grove area, but the last couple of years we have been doing it via Zoom and a little bit in person at a few of the different churches. So this coming Saturday, a few of us will join in on that starting at about nine and it will be in person at Mount Zion UCC on Ridgewood Road and or Zoom from your own home. Barb and I are going to be participating via Zoom. So we still have availability for another person to participate as a rep for our church. If you would like to do that, uh, please let us know and we will get you registered. Also, because uh, for Zoom, you can also do it via phone, just like we do on Sunday morning. So if it's something you're interested in, please let us know. Another quick reminder, uh, grocery cards are available after the service at the back table. We have Giant and Weiss if you're interested in those. Also, we're encouraging you to stop and check out our community garden and our pollinator garden, watching how they grow. They change every day and definitely every week. So if you only stop in once a week, it definitely is a lot different than it was last time you were here. So stop in, check out our garden over here in our uh, fenced in area. Be sure to say a prayer for it because remember the community garden, the veggies that we raise gets shared with everybody in the neighborhood. So please help us out with that. Also quick reminder, um, I will be taking the second half of my sabbatical. So I will be out for six weeks, starting June 21st through August 1st. So we have some great folks coming in to share worship with you while I'm out, as well as we have some great local pastors that are helping with emergency call coverage. So if you have a need, you'll be able to have pastoral care provided by one of uh, my colleagues. And I am very picky about who I ask to help. I want to make sure that they're going to treat you exactly like I would. And the ones that have um, are on my list to help out, you can rest assured that they will. So Joanne and Jean Caratinuti will be your contact people as well as Dawn when she's in the office. You don't have to remember that off the top of your head. It's in the, um, the Halo, our newsletter, but also I will provide an insert for you for next Sunday so that you have that for that time. Are there other announcements, joys, or concerns to lift up today? Ms. Lisa. Bob Dylan. Okay. Yes, I did see that Bob Dylan was one of the, was the main topic. Brush up on your Dylan. It might be helpful. And it could be a trip down that lane that can study you. All right. So Table Talk is going to revolve around Bob Dylan. So take a listen to some of his music, maybe look at a biography of him online or whatever, but he will be the topic of conversation for Friday night, as well as other things. Other announcements, joys, or concerns? Great. And my friends, as we enter into worship together this morning, remember that no matter who you are, where you've come from in the week past, or where you're headed in the week to come, for the next 30, 40 minutes or so, you are home. So let us prepare our hearts and souls for worship this morning.
as we do worship here in a hybrid version, meaning we have folks at home as well as those of us here in the sanctuary. Our liturgist this morning is Miss Delilah. As you can see, she's very excited to join us. So she will be leading us in part of our liturgy this morning from home. So you have it in your bulletin, so please join with her. Go ahead, Delilah. Okay. Please rise and join me to the call to worship. I'll give thanks to the Lord with your whole heart. May I call, you answered me. God's steadfast love endures forever. God. Let us confess our sins, for God has already forgiven us and is calling us to return to the Lord. Gracious, Gracious God, God have, have mercy on us, for we are to, to be faithful, faithful to you. To you. Though when you have been faithful, faithful to us, you show us your wisdom, but we, we prefer, prefer to, to go, go our own way. way. Our broken relationships with you and one another have created poverty in us and our neighbors. In your mercy, reconcile us to you and one another for the work of justice, peace, and love through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Friends do not lose heart when we call. God hears us when we confess God forgives us. We, we believe, believe and so we proclaim in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Holy God, let your spirit now move in us and turn us away from the temporary and move us to your eternal love made visible in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub. And the ruler of demons, cast, he cast out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against its against himself, he and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be, be plundered. Truly, I, I tell you, you tell you, you people will be forgiven for their for sins, for for their sins, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty for an eternal sin. For they said, had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and brothers came standing outside. They sent him. They sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my, bro my mother and brothers. Whoever does not do the will no, of whoever does. whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Here ends a scripture reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Delilah. That was great. So, so much of life that we encounter causes us and our relationships to become fragmented and broken in body and mind. We can often feel like we are out of control, that our very lives are not our own. Division is everywhere, Father Michael Marsh tells us. A marriage divided ends in divorce. A nation divided results in vitriolic politics and in the extreme civil war. An economy divided yields poverty and injustice. And a community divided becomes individualism and tribalism, prejudice and violence. Humanity divided is all of these things on a global level. Faith divided is sin, Marsh tells us. We all know what it is like to live divided lives when our outside and our inside don't match. When we are one person in work and another at home, Marsh says. So we allow our lives to become fragmented and often our behaviors, our beliefs, our ethics become situational. And pretty soon we're left with a bunch of broken pieces and wonder how to, and even if it is possible, to put those pieces back together again. While Jesus was born into and performed his ministry in this world, he came to teach and to heal all he encountered, to bring humanity back to bodily and emotional health, wholeness of community, unconditional acceptance through the forgiveness of sins, and by offering his life-giving love. Yet according to our story today, Jesus' family thought that he was not in his right mind. Why would they think that? I mean, especially his own mother that knew why he had been conceived and born into this world. Why would they imagine he wasn't thinking right, that he was crazy? Well, most likely because of fear. Everything he did appeared to be in direct opposition of their faith traditions and the Romans' political stance of that time, making him a target of the religious authorities as well as the local Roman ruler. I mean, who would intentionally stand in opposition of such authority? 
putting their life on the line, knowing that death by hanging on a cross was the end result of such treason. He definitely had to be crazy, right? Well, Jesus turns his family away when they come seeking him to drag him home and out of the public eye. He knows exactly what he is doing. He is fulfilling God's call in his life to help shed light on just how far humanity has moved away from the will of God. And just how much we have allowed ourselves to be influenced, corrupted even, by society, by the movement and the voice of the world, by the strong man, i.e. Satan, whom Jesus had come to defeat. Now I can hear you moving in your seats a bit and the denial starting to rise up in your minds and in the backs of your throat. No, I can hear it saying, no, I haven't. I haven't denied it. I haven't, I haven't uh, you know, stood in opposition of these things, but yet in reality, we have. The speed and strength with which we long to deny such influences most likely tells us how far we are from God's will and how much we want to believe that what society tells us we need to be successful. To feel good, to be powerful is true. When deep down we know that it is false and that for following society's messages leads us to continual struggle, to selfishly seek out after our own needs even at the expense of all others, including our family and friends. The world's way leads to brokenness. We know this because we have tried the world's way over and over, sometimes with success, but always at the expense of something else that we hold dear. We long to put the pieces of our lives, our relationships and our communities in the world back together again. We long to be comfortable, to feel like we're in control of such things, that we have the answers, yet God and God alone has the answers and can work with us to gain control of everything in our lives. In order to find and receive the answers we seek, we must become vulnerable to expose our own brokenness and to rely on God and others to help us heal, be whole, find acceptance and love that we seek. Here in the US, from the time we are little, we are taught that vulnerability is not good. It's synonymous with weakness and a means of letting others hurt and control us. So we're taught to go to extreme lengths, even to pretend if we have to, that we aren't hurting when it's obvious that we are, to appear strong in body and mind, to appear to be in control even when things are in total chaos around us. Why? What is the true benefit of doing this? Pretending that we are in control even when we obviously aren't. What is so wrong with showing our vulnerable side? Well, I think pottery is a great example of human life. We want to be a solid, beautiful, unflawed dish, bowl, or cup. We want to be useful, durable, able to withstand the tests of time. We want to be thick enough that most fumbles or drops can't cause much damage. Maybe a little chip here and there, but nothing major. However, we recognize that a major drop or hit can cause us to break maybe even more than just a chip or a crack. We're taught that the best way to repair something is to make the breaks invisible, to try to make the whole perfect again, or even better than it was before. We don't want to see the marks, the scars, and the results of our traumas. I mean, think about it. Who wants or needs a reminder of their most vulnerable moments, right? Is this realistic though? Is pottery humanity ever perfect without flaw? No. Is there anyone here who hasn't experienced something disappointing, painful, or even deep grief? Anybody? No. No, there isn't. Because life is full of hits, bumps, drops, and incidents that lead to harm, 
to hurt, damage, even catastrophic loss at times. It is how we deal with these events that make us into the person we are at the end of our lives. A child knows that learning anything requires a lot of trying, tears, hugs, and kisses to help make it feel better, and never giving up. You ever watch a child learn to walk? How many times do they fall before they get it? They are determined. Yeah. And when they have a boo-boo, they want a Band-Aid. They want proof that they have a boo-boo. And even if they don't have one, they really want a Band-Aid anyways, right? Especially the really cool ones with the cartoon characters now. Well, the Japanese art of kintsugi, if you look at our bowl up here. So kintsugi is a form of repairing pottery by mixing particles of real gold or other precious metals in with a resin or glue or bonding substance and putting the pieces back together. It is meant to emphasize the imperfections, to highlight the scars, making them part of the design. I mean, if you look at that image on the screen, the gold lines appear like they were intentionally crafted as part of the bowl, don't they? They look like they belong there. That's because they do. Yet these are the actual scenes where a careful hand has put this bowl back together again after it was broken. The art of kintsugi takes what was good, beautiful, useful, but is now damaged and broken. And through the art of repairing it, we actually create something more unique, more beautiful and resilient, Tiffany Ayuda states. Jesus came to teach us this art of kintsugi, of re recognizing our flaws, of using them to make ourselves stronger by repairing them in a way that the world can see them as the unique gifts, opportunities to learn and grow that they have been in our lives. Slide, please move on. Humanity is not perfect. We are prone to brokenness, to trying to go it alone, making unwise and unhealthy decisions, to following the influences of the outer world and struggling to cope and handle the fallout of these decisions and influences. Jesus shows us how to bind the strong man, the negative influences in our lives and to break their hold on us until they no longer have the ability to so strongly influence and or control our lives. When we forget, when we forge a deep abiding relationship with Jesus and God, we find that there is strength in vulnerability, not weakness, there is strength. We learn that relying on others to help and guide us along the way is good. Jesus can help us find the road of lifelong healing where we become the best version of ourselves, where we become healthy and whole and able to accept our own and others' brokenness for the gifts that they are. In her article, How the Japanese Art of Kintsugi Can Help You Deal with Stressful Situations, Ayuda states that this 400-year-old Japanese art form of repair and broken pottery can also help us learn to heal ourselves in new ways. She quotes Candace Kumai's book, Kintsugi Wellness, by saying, Kintsugi can be a way to reframe hardships, to remind yourself that you're not a victim of your circumstances, and to help you come out the other side stronger. You won't realize your full potential until you go through the tough times, Kumai says. Have you found that true? Yeah, I have. So I think this is an idea. It's a place where we should spend some time thinking about it. So I encourage you over the next few days to spend some time thinking about this concept of kintsugi and what your life has been like. So here's a few questions. Do you act like a victim that life and bad things are always happening to you? If so, why? Or why not? Do we call on Jesus and God to help us, to save us from our struggle, our pain and our suffering? Or do we ask 
and find that Jesus and God show us the way to healing and wholeness through each situation and incident. Hear the difference? Ask to save us from it, take it away from us, or ask us to learn how to use it to become stronger, healthy, and whole. Do we allow or invite others to walk with us and help us become stronger? Or do we believe that we must go it alone? How can your weakness become your strength? And can a person proclaim that they are a survivor without revealing what they have survived or how they have not just only survived but recovered, such as cancer, abuse, or addiction? Are they really a survivor if they don't claim it and name it? Do you show and claim your own brokenness, your weaknesses as part of who you are or do you hide them from others, even those closest to you, fearing that they will use them against you? And can your story of struggle and survival, your path to healing and wholeness help someone else if you share your story? There is so much for us to learn about ourselves and our relationship with Jesus and God through the identification and acceptance of our own areas of brokenness. The way of learning, healing, and wholeness is by letting Jesus into our lives, following where he leads, being vulnerable, asking for and allowing others to help us as we seek to help them. This is only true this is only truly possible, though, when we can openly and honestly accept that our reality, our perception of our own lives, and that they are and or should be, has fallen apart. So when we can accept and acknowledge that our lives, the way that they currently are, or we think they should be, has fallen apart, then we can claim a new one that is ready to rise within us, Marsh says. Jesus stands before us as this image of unity, of wholeness, of integration. He is the stronger one. He alone does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, Marsh says. He puts our lives back in order. Jesus offers a different image of what life might look like offering us something different, something better, something stronger, something more unique, beautiful, and resilient, if we trust. In the, be the beginning to wholeness, this newer, stronger, more beautiful, and resilient life is through acknowledging our brokenness. We do this by asking ourselves deep questions like, where are our lives divided right now? How and to what extent have we created inner conflict and division within our relationships? In what ways do we live fragmented lives, parceling out pieces of ourselves here and there? And what is it that shatters our lives? Is it anger and resentment, greed, insecurity, perfectionism, so sorrow and loss, fear, envy? Guilt, loneliness. And if we have the courage to give truthful answers to these questions, then we can seek a better future, Marsh says. He continues by saying that we are all sorts, there are all sorts of forces, things, events, sometimes even people by which our lives are broken and through which we are separated from God from others, and even from ourselves. Fortunately for us, Marsh says, Christ is stronger than anything that fragments our lives. He binds the forces that divide us, heals the wounds that separate us, and refashions the pieces into a new whole. There is nothing about your life, my life, that cannot be put back together by the love of God in Christ. We just need to be willing to open ourselves to God's healing love through Christ's guidance and actions. 
Friends, you, me, we all are a work of art, beautifully and wonderfully made in God's own loving image. We are fragile and strong. We are broken and whole. We are ordinary and unique, essential as individuals and necessary as part of the collective. God alone can take all of our broken pieces and fuse them back together like fragments of broken pottery seamed with gold, turning our hot mess into a more beautiful and resilient, renewed work of art that will rise in value in the days and years ahead. May you trust in these promises and boldly proclaim and wear the signs of your brokenness now healed, your vulnerabilities made strong in Christ for all the world to see. In Christ and through Christ, we live and breathe and have our being. May it be so. Amen. If you pull out your communion insert, please, and join me. And if you need to, go ahead and open your crackers and juice boxes, et cetera. Okay, join me in our liturgy this morning for communion. May the God of steadfast love be with you and also with you. Sisters and brothers of Christ, lift your hearts up to God. We open ourselves to the one who fills us with grace. Beloved of the Lord, sing glad praises to God. Songs of wonder are offered to our God. Catching a glimpse of goodness and beauty, you shattered the stillness of chaos with your, ima your imaginative word, your spirit of faith moving, transforming, shaping, and creating. What had not been seen before sprang forth. Suns and moons spinning in the galaxies, rivers racing one another to the seas, gentle grains whispering in the breeze. This garden of wonders and hopes were shared with those you created in your image. But we wanted to do things our way, and we turned away from you for the temptations offered to us by sin and death. You would not forsake us and sent the prophets to tell us with words of hope and grace, but we, rejoiced their, we rejected their words as having no meaning for us. Your love was steadfast, and your faith for us did not diminish as you sent Jesus to call us back to your heart. With those whose faith is strong and firm, with those who struggle to believe, with all of every time and place, we sing and read our songs of thanksgiving to you together, saying, Holy, holy, holy are you, God of our hearts. All creation praises you with words of hope. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes to strengthen our souls. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy God of hope and forgiveness. And Jesus Christ is your love made human. He could have come to divide us, but came that we might be one with you and with our sisters and brothers. He could have come to defy, to defy us, but he came to reject death and sin's claim on us, defeating their power once and for all. As we remember how we have turned our backs on him, as we hear this invitation to this table of grace, we speak of that faith in which we believe, saying together, Christ died, showing us the way of obedience. Christ is raised, showing us the way of new life. Christ will come again, showing us your glory. You surround us with your care, stretching out your hand upon those gathered in this place, your spirit transforming ordinary gifts into sacred grace 
and hope. We taste the bread and drink from the cup and notice that we have not seen the hunger of the world, the loneliness of those around us, the child with no hope, and we do not lose heart, trusting that you will use us to serve these needs around us so that grace upon grace might be shared with our sisters and brothers. And when you stretched out your hands to lead us home, and we are gathered around the feast of the lamb, which we can only glimpse in this moment together, we will sing of your steadfast love and faithfulness, and even God, and ever God in community, holy in one. But today, as we gather here, we do so to remember. We remember that in, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered around a table with those nearest and dearest to him. During the meal, he took some bread, a lot like this, a flat bread. He offered it up to you, God. He blessed it, and then he broke it, and he gave it to each of them. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. At the end of the meal, he took up that last cup, the cup of blessing. He again offered it to you, God. He blessed it, and then he offered it to them. He offered it to us. And he said, this is the new covenant, which shall be poured out for me for you. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. Let us bless these elements together. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table, that our eyes may be open and we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other and in all for whom Christ died. Amen. Before we share in our meal together, I invite you to grab your bulletin again. We are going to sing the third verse of our hymn from earlier. If you will join in that, please. As we gather for this meal, we remember that here at this table, Christ is always the host. We are the guests. He is the host that invites all of us here. This table is open for every single person born on this earth. It is open for our youngest to our oldest, for those who are devout and those who are always questioning and wondering and struggling. This table and this meal is for strangers, and is for those that we know. This table is for you that came yesterday and is also for you who has not eaten with Christ in a long time. This meal is for each of us to renew us in mind, body, and spirit. So together we eat. So please join me as we eat of bread and of juice.
Please join me as we give thanks for our meal together. Holy One, we give you thanks for refreshing us at your table, for renewing our hearts and spirits, strengthening our faith, increasing our love for one another, and sending us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Who are Christ's brothers and sisters? According to the scripture today, it says those who do the will of God. Loving God, loving neighbor, we share what we have as members of this household of Christ. Our offering has been collected in the plate at the back on the table. If you did not get a chance to place it there when you came in, you may do so as we leave. But we will rise, sing our doxology, and then we will bless the offerings that we have to give together. Eternal God, your son Jesus teaches us that a house divided cannot stand. Together we offer ourselves and our gifts that they may be used to extend your grace to others for your glory through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, my friends, it is hard to believe that our time together is already drawing to a close. So hear this challenge benediction on your life for this week my friends do not lose heart for day by day we are being prepared for god's glory immeasurable and eternal so may the steadfast love of god give us hope the redeeming power of christ give us courage and the abiding peace of spirit give us strength as we serve the will of god this day and every day Amen. Please be seated. Quick reminder before we depart, the creative worship team and council will be meeting briefly after worship to talk about summer plans while I'm gone for worship, our precautions that we've been doing to decide what we will be continuing or not. So please hang around, come up towards this side of the sanctuary. But every time we finish worship together, we always stop to remember we remember that every time Jesus came into the presence, and especially every time he departed those nearest and dearest, he offered them the glorious and amazing gift of God's peace. So friends, may the peace of Christ be with each of you. Amen. Go in peace. Have a fabulous week, and we will see you soon. So take care, everybody. Bye.